worship team. Thank you guys for your faithfulness and tithe and offering. Amen. May the Lord Jesus abundantly bless. May God the Father open up as he promises the window of heaven out of Malachi and pour you out the blessing that you cannot withhold. In Jesus' holy name. Father, Lord, this message bigger than I will ever be all the way to eternity. Oh, Lord God, beyond me, right now. Only you, Father. Lord, Holy Spirit, sir, only your grace from Jesus, from the Father, to us. Oh, Lord. Amen. There's a passage that talks about God the Father in an end day plan pouring out the spirit of grace and supplication upon Israel in the end day. Any of you guys, any of you guys know that passage? Well, that S is capitalized. Let's see if I can find it for you. How about that? Zechariah 12 and 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Now stay with me for a moment. I got a question for you. No, I don't have a question for you. If you can stay with me, stay with me. If you just here, okay. Do you notice that that uh, S is capitalized in the original language? Do you see that? I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit capitalized of grace. <coughs> I want to tell you what that means. It means when God the Father decides to do that, he's going to take Lord, Holy Spirit, give him the grace for Israel, and Lord, Holy Spirit is going to come to Israel in the grace that has been given to the church. Only it's going to shift to Israel. That means for the one who has an ear, that means that we want to walk out grace so that we never come out from under grace so that it never lifts off of the remnant church. When we go join Lord Holy Spirit as he pours out grace from himself as Lord of that grace, as literally great Lord grace, one of the titles of Lord Holy Spirit on Israel and us in the end of it. You get that now? 
so that you can begin, if you want to be intimate with Lord, Holy Spirit, you can begin to say to him one of his titles, Great Lord Grace. Great Lord Grace. You ever heard Brother David Hogan say, Come on, Grace. He's saying, Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Grace. Me and you, Grace. He's calling the Holy Spirit by one of his names as a friend. Him and David, friend. That's where you go. So then, Do you know that God graces us to do a thing? We pray because he graces us to pray. Lord Holy Spirit gives us the grace to pray, and we pray in that grace. And we read his word, and we understand what it's saying because he graces us to understand. He lets the revelation of Jesus out of our hunger. We don't have the ability to follow. We don't have the ability to follow so fully that we could see Jesus. But Lord Holy Spirit has the ability out of our hunger to follow, to reveal Jesus to us and give Jesus to us out of the scriptures, all by grace. It's Lord Holy Spirit administering grace to us at that moment for us to see and behold Jesus. Now, there are times when we go against grace. Now, I have a fasting time is kind of taking care of a good bit of my excess, but as a norm, I can always find excess. So I'm going to squat down and tell you that I can always find excess. Amen. Now, how about y'all? Can y'all find excess? Even in the best of days, I can find excess. Did you know I got my excess because I slipped outside of grace? The Lord said, eat an apple. And I said, I would love to have a Hardee's burger cheese burger with lots of mayonnaise. What time is it? 11.59. You should not have that. Oh yeah, but it tastes good. I'm not that old yet and my body will take it. I slid out of grace. Lord, Holy Spirit knew what I needed to eat. I did not need to eat a fatty hamburger dumped into my bloodstream at midnight. You follow me? It's amazing. A great grace of God over us. It's all by grace. There isn't anything that does happen that does not happen. It's all by grace. If it happens and it's God, grace did it. God in his grace did it. One of the real needs of the hour is for the pulpit to learn how to stay up under grace. I am flesh and blood. And if I have pride in myself or I have a need of, and you just fill in the blank or any other minister on the planet, or you, when you were ministered, if we have a something that we're after, and it's in our will instead of the will of God, we slide right off of grace ministering the plan of heaven over to our plan of man. It's just that easy to come right out of from under grace. And then what happens? Well, control slips in. How does control get into anything? Well, when we're ministering to another, for Jesus is his under shepherd. We want to do with their life what we want, rather than the will of God for them, that's control. When we try to direct the traffic, instead of heaven directing the traffic, we're in control. We're in the spirit of control. We're out from under the spirit of grace. Even as a parent with children, you gotta be careful. 
You're not so bad to just try to like you kill him. That's definitely out from under grace. Amen? How many of us have ever thought that? Amen? <laughs> That's out from under grace. Grace formed that child in our image, in, in the image of God in us. God formed us in his image. Then gave us a child and formed that child in our image. And I have three adopted sons. They have my image. So then, we have got to learn how to stay with great Lord grace, which is Lord the Holy Spirit serve himself. He is the spirit of grace. Lord Holy Spirit sir, you are the spirit of grace. This is just one little idea, but false prophecy. You know, we just had a wonderful gathering of the prophets uh, Friday night. Awesome presence of the Lord. Much happening there. The Lord in control. And we learned that there are three types of prophets. There's a true prophet, there's a false prophet, and both of those are saved. One of them is just missing the heart of God and the other is hitting it. And then there's the heathen prophet, and he's not saved, and all three can prophesy to you. Now how do we get false prophecy happening? It's because the vessel that's bringing the prophecy slides out from under grace and goes for being important in their eyes as the one that prophesies their blessing from God. We get in between God and the blessing because we want to be seen, we want to be known. And we're out from under grace and prophesying falsely. Why? Because Jesus is the only one who is known in prophecy. He is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Him revealed puts prophecy on course to that person. And we're just a vessel. They get the gift. It's not even ours to hold on as a text. It's theirs. Understand that? There's a place where power comes alongside grace. I'm going to show you how that works. When we do what we know, which is all of us doing everything we know to the best of our ability of under Lord Holy Spirit to glorify Jesus' name to accomplish the Father's will instead of our own. When we do what we know, and we lean on God the Father. We look to Lord Holy Spirit. We acknowledge Jesus in every bit of it. And we're seeking the Father's will done in our life. We still don't know enough to do it perfect. How many of us know more about the Lord today than we knew a year ago? Amen? Well, a year ago, we couldn't do it as good as we can do today. What does that tell us? It tells us that a year from now, if we stay on course and love the Lord and don't backslide, we'll be able to do it better than we are sitting right in that seat right there. But it still won't be perfect. So what does God do when we are not perfect? As long as we're looking to Lord Holy Spirit, leaning on God the Father, acknowledging Jesus and what we do, we're seeking the Father's will instead of our own, He graces us. And what we do, we do up under grace by grace. Now, if you'll get away from the word for a moment and go to the title of Under Great Lord Grace. We do. Those that are what? I'm going to substitute now. Those that are led by Great Lord Grace shall be called the sons and the daughters of God. Those that are led by the Spirit shall be called the sons of God. Amen? So then, when we do that, in our imperfection, in our weakness, Paul said, he said, I want to be weak. I figured it out. Let me be weak because that's when God's coming. When I do all that I can, but I know I'm weak and I 
face the fact that I'm weak and I don't try to be the strength, I let him come to my weakness and be the strength. At that moment, power kicks in from heaven. That's the moment power kicks in. And we want to walk in what? Grace and power. Now where does that power kick in? From God the Father's covenant of love with us because we're doing all we know and leaning on him. That's the moment where grace and power team up. Look at this. Lord Holy Spirit has came on the day of Pentecost. Years have gone by, 12 actually, with the whole city ablaze and the fire of God. Peter's teaching every moment at Solomon's portico on the south side of the temple and 20 plus thousand people there. The presence of the Lord. And miraculous things are happening so much that Peter's shadow is healing. And Stephen, one of the deacons chosen, is full of grace and power. What does that tell us? It means that Stephen never came out from under the grace of God. He just walked with the Lord. He just listened to the Lord Holy Spirit. He just acknowledged Yeshua on the ship as the Christ. And the Lord Holy Spirit said, as long as you bow, I'm kicking in the power of heaven over your life, through your life, in your life, around your life. Go for it, Stephen. I'm with you. You understand that? That's what Stephen was doing. Oh, he was full of grace and power. And what was happening? He was stepping into wonders and signs among the people. Now really learn. How many of us want to have grace and power out of our life? Really learn what the scripture is about to say. There were men from the synagogue of the freedmen, including Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, and they rose up and argued with Stephen. Look at the miraculous sign and wonder and grace and power flowing like a river. Imagine the wind of God blowing in the field of wheat. What's going to be happening? The wheat's going to be bowed. The wind is going to be low in the wheat. And the wheat's just going to be bowed and in the wind. What's the tears going to be doing? Yeah, I'm resisting the wind. Don't want to bow. Don't want to bow. No, no, no. No, I'm not going to bow. I'm not. You can see it? Happens all the time in the house of God. Tares and wheat, tares and wheat, tares and wheat. Wheat bows, tares does not. The word of the Lord rose this morning. So there's an argumentative spirit that always fights grace. Now how many of us have ever had an argumentative spirit? Notice my hand is up first. Amen? Okay? If you have never had an argumentative spirit, you don't have to do this. But if you've had an argumentative spirit, go up and repent to two people. Say, I repent of having an argumentative spirit. In Jesus' name. For a moment that everyone in this room, everyone in the room, sound of my voice, every single person is walking where Stephen was in the scriptures. We have grace over us. We're staying up under the shadow of the wings of the Lord. Power is kicking in. Sign and wonder is happening. Amen. Among the people and the people of God are learning who God really is. Everyone in this room moving in that. And then the argumentative spirit comes up against you. 
You can't be mad at that person. You still have a goal from heaven. But it goes to a second stage. Once the argumentation starts and they can't get to you, this is what happens. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit. Now notice that's capital with which he was speaking. Stephen wasn't speaking. Great Lord Grace was speaking through him. It wasn't Stephen's words. He was just a mouthpiece. Great Lord Spirit was speaking what he wanted to speak. Oops. God the Father told me to deliver this the way he gave it. So I'm obeying it. So then, they were unable to cope with the wisdom. They tried. And the spirit with which he was speaking, they tried to cope. And then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Pride will always try its wisdom against God's wisdom. Every time. But it can't cope with God's wisdom. And then attacks through blaspheming the vessel happen. I give you a question, Father. No, I withhold that question. And they stirred up the people. This is round three. After blaspheming comes this. They stirred up the people. How many of you have ever been stirred up by someone else? Your ear was sitting there and you heard and you knew good and well Lord Holy Spirit wasn't saying that. But it stirred you. That's the spirit that is against the spirit of grace. It's an antichrist spirit. It's against the spirit of grace. It's against Lord Holy Spirit. So then they came, laid hands on, dragged him away, and brought him before the council. I got to tell you, if we were to have a ministerial council in the city, there would be people who would come and submit to the council as long as the council amen what they wanted from the council. But the moment the council spoke the actual true word of God to them, they run and do their own thing like they're doing in the first place before they ever got to the council. This is a spirit. So they bring false witnesses. This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. Now, Lord Holy Spirit is in charge of Stephen. And the Spirit of the Lord is speaking. And he's speaking to Cyrenians and Alexandrians and Cilicians and Asians. And they're hearing and watching all these signs and wonders. And they're hearing. But it doesn't move them. Can you imagine being that hard hearted, that entrenched in your will? It doesn't move them. So they bring false witness. Did you know that's one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not. It is not an offer. I'd like for you to please consider that you should not do this. No. God the Father said, this is my command for my children. You are to be on guard and to never bring false witness. The command, one of the ten. We've heard him say that this Nazarene, Jesus, who will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. Fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Now I gotta tell you, at that point, if you were thinking, maybe I'm right and they really have all been wrong but me all my days. You know, everything I've said is correct, but suddenly they had the face of an angel shining with the glory of God. 
You would think the resistant heart to the will of God might stop in its tracks at that moment. But no. When we are out from under grace, that's me, that's you, that's the whole church, all of us together in a clump. When we are out from under grace, we are never after truth, only what our self-will wants. Can you understand that? Now, how many of us have ever wanted what we wanted? And we wanted what we wanted, we didn't care what nobody else wanted, we wanted it. So how about us repenting? I'll go first. Betty? I repent of wanting what I want. Amen. So give that a try. Say hello to a few people. Try that on. This is a story in Acts. And this is an often quoted apostolic arrangement of scripture. What makes the church apostolic? Uses this a lot. But we're after one verse and one thought. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. Now, how many of us own property? I do. Amen. How many of us think it's not yours? Amen. Amen. In my and Jorina's situation, my property is paid for. By the way, did you know that if your property is paid for in South Carolina and it is worth more than $100,000, any debt which you have in South Carolina can go to judgment with the court and they can take what you own outright and sell it for anything they want according to what you owe. You owe $6,000 on a card and you default. They can take you to court, place a judgment against you and then get your $250,000 house for $6,000 to sell to a friend for $6,000 and he'll own your $250,000 house for $6,000. You cannot default on anything in South Carolina. Don't ever be deceived. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. Don't borrow what you intend not to repay if you owe anything. They can come get your boat. They can come get your dog house if you own it outright. You follow me? Bless the Lord. You cannot default. Don't borrow. Become the lender. So then, here's an entire congregation, 20,000 plus people in Jerusalem. An entire congregation, eventually. And they don't believe that they own what they own. They believe that the Lord owns it. Now, how did that happen? How did they get that deep up under the Lordship of great Lord grace? With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. Great Lord grace had dropped on the church. And up on the great Lord grace, they didn't care what they ate. They didn't care where they slept. They didn't care who owned what. They didn't care about tomorrow. All they cared about was obeying great Lord grace. That's how that thing happened. It happened by grace. Did you know that that's what we want in the move of God for Charleston, South Carolina? We want great Lord grace to drop <laughs> in the city. Christians are going to get mad because peoples whom they thought ought to go to hell are going to get restored. You hear me? That's a great restoration ahead. There are peoples who are mad at me and God's going to restore some of them. 
I hope he restores all of that. You understand that? I don't want a single one to perish. No, I love them all. If I've ever loved you, I still love you. Y'all want to go get mad at me? Go ahead. I'll still love you. Why? Because grace tells me I should. Great Lord grace tells me I should. He never told me to stop loving. Doesn't mean their position is right. But he never said stop loving them. Amen? So then, there was not a needy person among them for all Every single one of them who are owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would distribute to each as any had need. Grace was supplying abundance of spirit to spirit leading. The natural needs were being supernaturally surrendered through the abundant graces leading. Amen? Are y'all seeing this? Because next week, I'm hoping you're going to walk up under great Lord grace so much that by the time I see you again, you will begin to intimately say, great Lord grace, Lord Holy Spirit. This is the scripture. Where Israel so suddenly sees Yeshua was actually their Messiah. And when it hits all by great Lord grace, dropping like a second Pentecost onto Israel, the spirit of grace convicts every conversation, brings them up right into understanding and suddenly supplication hits them and they begin to cry to God. This is the move in Israel that is coming. And the sad part about it is grace is in the earth and it's on the church. Now listen to me. Every moment of division not God, out from under grace. Every moment of argumentation, not God, out from under grace. When have us been mad at anybody? Out from under grace. Get back under. God's not mad. Why should we be mad? You understand? We want to be like our father. And so, the church has got to quit rejecting grace and get back to the one who sends that grace, Lord Holy Spirit, before he pours it out on Israel because we want to be a part. Listen closely now. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If you don't think that was what they were saying in the church, look at the end structure sentence of a couple of the New Testament books. Second, in Philippians 4.23, that is the last verse of Philippians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now let's take a moment. Grace does not come to the soul. Hear this now. The grace of the Lord does not come to our soul. It comes to our spirit man and our spirit man commands our soul to stay up under what has been given to our spirit man and abide up under grace. Our soul will try to rise up and rule our spirit. And our spirit up under grace says, no soul, you got to be redeemed. And we redeem it through a choice that we make in our spirit man. 
How many of us have ever had to choose to forgive? Was it a choice? And until you made that choice, forgiveness did not flow out of your heart. But the moment you decided to forgive, oh, the healing of the Lord Jesus Christ flowed by the Lord and Holy Spirit through our life. It's a choice. But the grace comes to the spirit man. Now, i got to tell you something. We'll go one verse more. Galatians 6, 18, that is the last verse of Galatians. Look at the similarity. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. And there's an amen there in the scriptures. What is the Lord saying? He's saying that the greeting, the salutation, and the ending of the church were tied to something that they were all saying across the globe. There wasn't a saint on the earth who did not understand the grace. Now listen to me. It was not the grace of Jesus. No, no. It was the grace of the Lord Jesus who is the Christ. So many times we have had salvation through a simple prayer that only turned us into a convert. We're converted from sin over to salvation, and yes, we are saved. But when you get saved by the Lord Jesus, the Christ, you become a disciple. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There's a difference between a convert and a disciple. A disciple gets disciplined and welcomes it. The convert hates discipline because he's still in that independent, proud, arrogant, bratish soul. I like you until you get on my nerves, and then I don't like you. Well, maybe Lord Holy Spirit is trying to get your nerves saved. You understand this? I have dessert in this message. I hope you enjoy dessert. Oh, honey, where are you? You're supposed to have been up here. I just, come on up. You want this microphone right now? Okay. When you want it, I want to give it to you. Grace. I want to teach you something. Can I teach you something? Yes. If I were to say, Grace! Your soul would listen up. And you would feel, y'all ever seen those things that put that, uh, that pile that they build houses on at the beach when they think the ocean might come in so they build it up on pilings and that, I don't know if you've ever seen that thing. Basically, that's just a winch inside of a round cylinder that's hollow. And there's basically a heavy hammer that weighs as much as a couple of cars. And it gets hauled up to the top and then released. <laughs> up it goes again. goodness they don't do 24 hours a day. Nobody around it would sleep till the house was built. You follow me? Well, if I were to take this message and I were to shout it out to your soul, you would hear it until you walk through those doors and you forget every bit of it. This message cannot be given except to the spirit inside that is born again, that is hungry for the Lordship of Jesus the Christ. And on that mark, the 
church will backslide. Out of coldness of heart, or surrender and come into the greatest outpouring the world has ever known. Oh, my great Lord Grace. Because grace is the truest glimpse of Lord Holy Spirit we can spiritually perceive. Because it is not by might or by power, but by Him. So when the scripture says it's not by might or by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The Lord is saying my spirit, Lord Holy Spirit, is going to bring my lordship. And that's how it's going to be done, not by might nor by power. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by him. Great Lord, grace. I wanted to share a, a real a practical example of grace. Uh, the Lord spoke to me like uh, 30 years ago. And he said, you could paint. And I said, I can my family was real good at sewing and doing different things. And he said, get some oils, you can paint. And so I, I, I bought a canvas and I sat it there and looked at it for about a, a week or two. And the Lord said, you can paint. So I was trying to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I picked up the brush and the first one I did looked like an enchanted forest with a whole bunch of water. I said, here, Seymour, that's for you. I mean, it's just like a bunch of green. I mean, I did the clouds really good for the first time I ever painted. And I did three paintings, but the third painting is the painting that you see in the library with the one with the eagle lying in that uh, red. I painted that, I did that. Never painted before in my life. That was a picture of grace. What grace does is grace. This is grace. That picture is the eagle of God chasing the devil. And the devil is small, and that eagle is big, and that eagle is bearing down on that devil, and he's running, flying through the airway as fast as he can go, and the eagle's gaining on him. And so um, I just, I really saw from that when the Lord revealed us, we were in prayer last night, and the Lord just dropped it, because I've been asking the Lord, Lord, show us about grace. I really want to know. What is grace? Because we don't have a real clear picture of what grace really is. But grace is to do what we cannot do. That's what grace is. That's why it says, not by mouth, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And but in order to enter into that grace, to that grace place of God, we gotta bow our will. Because you don't get there. God won't grace it. Seymour gave a really wonderful uh, testimony and story about A.W. Tozer, who walked with Edward Mueller. And these two guys said, you know what? We're the most powerful two men on the scene. And he said, I'm so sorry that you said that. Because he knew the moment that he thought it was him and not grace, the grace lifted. And that's what happens on so many ministries. You know, I, I had, uh, the Lord was showing me a picture of what grace looks like. I think, let's take this little battery right here. Is that small? This is the little work that we could do. With all of our striving, we could strive in ministry and our own self-strength. And this is how much we can produce. This about this. But when we begin to cry out for grace and see that it is not us, it is not our work, it's not our strength. It's not what we can do. And God applies his grace to our work. Then all of a sudden it looks like this. And then take it all the way through the ceiling. Through the stratosphere. And do you know that it's very few people that find that level of grace. So we say A.W. Tozer found it. A. Allen found it. Uh, a lot of the great men of God found that grace. There was another guy who said that... Uh, he said, Lord, he, went, he said, Lord, I'm saving all these souls for you. Lord, I did all of this stuff for you. I evangelized for you. 
And the Lord spoke to him and said, you didn't save not one soul. Amen. My grace was the one that drew them in. See, he was walking in the grace of the Lord. So everything, and scripture says, every man's been given a measure of grace. The whole picture of grace is in Job. When you read Job, Job talks about, uh, the Lord comes to Job and he says, see all the animals, I did this, I did that, I did, you know, and, and he was complaining before the Lord. And Job said, the Lord spoke to Job and said, look at the ostrich. He doesn't even have enough understanding to cover up his eggs lest they get crushed. God gave him the amount of knowledge that that ostrich needed. He gave the horse what he needed. He gave you your personality. He gave you the way that you walk. He gave you the way that you understand. If, we, if God was to take that away from us, we would be just nothing. And that's how God wants us to stand before him so that we could be like Stephen, walking in great power and great grace. But we have to have it all the way down in our knower that it's the grace of God and not us. And that's a true picture of grace is God and not us. No matter what we do, what ability we have is God and not us. And when we understand that, then we begin to cry out, Father, give me the grace. I was praying for Betty last night as I laid there, and I began to pray. I said, Father, give Betty grace to play for you. And she, I walked in this morning, and she was praying like, oh, my God, Betty. And she said, oh, I just felt the glory of the Lord last night. I said, well, I was just praying for God to pour his grace out on you. Saints, we need to start praying for grace. When we get ready to do something, it, you know, Scripture says, may grace be granted unto us when we come to you to do what we're called to do. We need to start praying for God, give us the grace to do what we cannot do. But you only get that grace when you understand that you can't do it. See, because you got to humble yourself. As long as you can do it, grace isn't doing it. Long as you're doing it, grace is not, not doing it. When we take the natural grace we've been given, the measure of grace we've been given, and think that's the grace that you go and do the mighty exploits, you can't do it. So the beginning, the beginning of walking out in the grace of the Lord is just to say, Father, give me grace. So you want to do something, Lord, say, Lord, give me grace to do this. actually covered this point. The Lord said, give it to you. As he gave it, I have to obey that. Keep going. I have seen, I have, I've seen how the work of God gets done. Now we're not talking about just work. The work of God gets done by grace. Grace does it. We just get invited to see God move. And he does it. We cooperate with the Lord, and he comes on the scene. I want to tell you a story. This something was Thursday, this Thursday. They had a meeting with uh, Ms. Morrow, Ellen Morrow, and she is the director of the cultural, of the Office of the Cultural Affairs in the city of Charleston. And uh, Ray, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, is also the production manager if you want to film in the city. And we went into basically what is City Hall's area and the secretary waits on us and then we get to go into the CEO, Mrs. Marl's office and talk with her. And we've been after the worship gathering to the audience of one on one of the four corners of law downtown. That's an old prophecy. Who would have thought, I never dreamed, never dreamed that the Lord would order my steps, partially or fully, I do not know, that he would order my steps to fulfill that prophecy. I never even thought the prophecy was the Lord. Showed you what I know. And 
his morals begins to come up under the favor of the Lord. The favor of God kicks in in her CEO office. And at the end of the meeting, she says, what else can we do for you to expedite this gathering? And I pause for a moment and I say, prayer. She burst out into a gentle smile and she said, oh, I need all the prayer I can get. Now this is the cultural CEO director of Spoleto and every other event in the city. This is the top position in the city. And so we end and I say, well, perhaps this is too forward, but why don't I just pray for you right now? And she says, would you pray for me in private? And I say back, when you move in this realm, the Lord, Holy Spirit, you cannot have the fear of man, okay? And I say back, and I say, I cannot believe as the cultural director of the city of Charleston, South Carolina, you are embarrassed for me to pray for you. And she said, some things are private but I trust that you will be praying for me privately and I will know it. And I said to her, my Lord, Holy Spirit, as his grace kicked in over the office structure of City Hall, I said, God the Father has been pouring forth his spirit in several meetings and the power of the Lord has been flowing so strongly that when God does what he does, I will not be in charge. I will not know what to do. I will not know how to lead anybody because God is going to be in charge and he's going to be leading. And I share with you that you're going to experience his presence in this office while you work. And she wrote down our cell, asked for our cell number why, because she might be calling us. As we exited the building in the elevator, I asked the Father to begin, and the power of God the Father began to consume City Hall. The power of the Lord hit the atmosphere of that building. It's residing right now. God, when they come in Monday, they're going to begin to sense, just like y'all did in church. They're not. I don't know if they're saved or not, doesn't matter. God is on the scene. How did that happen? Grace. I just want to add this one little tip that uh, as we were leaving, the lady grabbed me and she said, it was such a pleasure to meet you. And she hugged me like I was an old family member, something that she hadn't seen in a long time. So that was, it was really a divine moment in God's presence really did come just just came into the room and the guy that was you know really tall he was tall and he seemed kind of gay even his spirit you could see his countenance softened and uh it was just it was really a god moment it was awesome and just so you know they didn't have an ounce of jurisdiction in what we were requesting <laughs> Turns out that what we were asking for is the county, and the county owns that whole corner, and the city has nothing to do with it. So with the favor of the county, by God's great, how grace, by Lord, holy grace, going over wherever he wishes to go and present God the Father's will and Jesus the Christ, the Lord's name. We get to go. Didn't matter if the city didn't like it. Doesn't matter if everybody in the city hates it. We get to go because it's county inside the city. Isn't that wild? So why did God take this long to orchestrate all of this to a moment where we don't even need them? Because we do need them ahead. We need the favor and the grace of Jesus to come over Ellen Morrow's, the cultural director of Charleston, for when we want to take the whole city street of Broad Street, our meeting street, our church street, or the whole park 
with 40,000 people up under the canopy of glory. Can you understand this? Can such an awesome thing come out of such a small church? Only by grace. Because grace is going to do it. We're not going to have to do it. Grace is going to do it. Can you understand this now? Grace does where flesh cannot go. Green told you that story, brother told you. Psalm 62 says the ark, Lord. I'll tell it again. A.W. Tozier was Dwight L. Moody's head president, administrator over Moody Bible College. A.W. Tozier is in the history books as one of the great theologians of God. And he would go into Presbyterian and Methodist churches and preach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they would get slain in mass. <laughs> in the Presbyterian and the Methodist churches and the Episcopal. He went in those realms. But it was Brother Moody who opened the door for him and sent him. They wanted Brother Moody and Brother Moody said, no, Brother Tozer, you're going. Brother Moody was always putting people forward. And one of the things he learned from Brother Moody is it is the Lord, not us. Stay humble. Don't get in the way. And so literally, Brother Tozier was being used by another brother who was well known in the nation. Well known. And they were both national voices in the nation. Not just the states, but in the whole of the nation and beyond over into Europe. And they were both arranged in a certain meeting together where they both ministered. And as the ministry was over and that night was over, they were walking down the sidewalk. This brother said to Brother Tozier, Brother Tozier, you and I are the two most important men in the nation right now. Brother Tozier did not hesitate. He said this to his dear friend. He said, I am so sorry to hear you say that. Because scripture is filled with men whom God was using. And the moment they thought it was them, God lifted. What's ahead? We are not going to do, saints. Grace is going to do it. This city is going to bow to Jesus. And great Lord grace is going to do it. This city is going to not have a stone left and swept up under the rug. It's going to repent of every sin it's ever had. And great Lord grace is going to do it. <laughs> Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. <laughs> and loving kindness is yours too, Lord. <laughs> or you recompense a man according to his work. <laughs> I have a question for you. Can y'all handle dessert? Yes. Take three minutes and come back. Amen. I will go back by grace <laughs> because Janet, you're such a wonderful note taker of the Lord. But, you know, you can get Lillian to email this thing intact to you by simply asking, All right, is this the one I'm after? Or the one before it? I didn't know. Is that it? Okay.
make this announcement. Don't go away without one of these and spread it wherever you wish. Make copies, give away. This is an awesome gathering. This is Brother David Hogan's son, Jody, who has been running Mexico for about the last seven years. Nobody knew that Brother David was going through the earth. When New Zealand called, Brother David go to New Zealand. Pakistan called, Brother David go to Pakistan. Australia, Brother David go to pa Australia. Jody has been running the team in Mexico. Now, when I met Brother Jody, right at 200, not quite 200 people had been raised from the dead. Right now, it's over 500. What does that tell you? It means that Brother Jody knows every question we could ever have about rank, authority, how to flow, how to stand, divine deliverance when they shoot you point blank with a gun and how to live through it by the power of the Most High God over your life. He knows how to drink green water and have God bless it. Amen. There is nothing in the world of sign and wonder, though there's always something, that you and I could come up with that they haven't experienced. They've seen every form of disease and sickness and ailment and ailment. Amen? Bring to this meeting your friends. Bless the Lord. And when we were with Brother David, in Colombia, just a couple weeks ago, Brother David told me, in order for our schedule, which has got to go see Michael, Michael Howard's only in America once this year. He's not coming to any church. He's coming to one place in America, in Chicago. And we got to watch God get us there. And uh, we've got to go to that meeting and that meeting interfered with the days that Jody could come. So Brother David swapped off a meeting, a church that he was supposed to go to and sent Jody to that church and went to one of Brother Dave, Jody's meetings himself. They swapped meetings so that he could come to us. You understand this? So Brother David is sending his son to us. Now, I don't know how many of you were with Brother David. I try to explain this. You'll have to fathom the best you can. When Brother David first opens his mouth, when they give him the mic, with so much skill, that you will even not know it has been done. He will re-correct and redirect everything that church is doing wrong. In his opening sentence out of his mouth. And it's done with such love, not done with condemnation, that pastor or that leader comes under conviction and says, oh my, I have been in me a little bit, haven't I, Brother David? Yes, you have, brother. They know the conversation happens, but nobody else does. But you watch. When Brother David came, I don't say that we will escape, even Jody, amen. When Brother David came a couple years ago, and he said to Messiah's church, now, I know that Brother David gets checks all the time that are blank, and they tell him, fill in the amount. He was offered a million dollars for a major television broadcasting network to go film somebody raised from the dead, and he laughed at them with scorn in his tone. Because they would have been trying to use what God was doing for his glory to gain funds and he scorned them. And yet he will come to us. And his opening words were, 
I just came to say thank you to some that don't mean much, but to others, it means a lot. Thank you, Messiah's Church. <laughs> you can't gain that friendship. You can't buy it. You couldn't earn it, but God gave it. Jody is our friend. Bring. Amen. So then are y'all ready for dessert? Yes. I need you to shuffle yourself. Come get on the first two rows. Greg and Ann are almost there. As you guys get on, the, I'll just let you guys get on the front row because I would really want to speak something to your spirit, man. Thank you, Lord. As God begins to just speak to Seymour and I about grace, I realize that grace is something that you have to get inside of your spirit, man. That you gotta understand it with everything that's in you so that every step you take is filled with grace. Everything you try to do for God, you need to say, God, let your grace, I pray that grace be granted. And that needs to be a prayer life that we have because we just live in the basic grace of salvation. But scripture says we go from grace to grace and faith to faith. And we, we stay on such a low rung of grace, but there's so much grace to be given. When Seabird talked about Brother Hogan, Brother Hogan said he saw a guy that was all bent up from birth and somebody had mercy on him and uh, made pads for his arms and his legs because he was just sliding along the ground, all folded up. And he said he sat there and he he said, the Lord straightened this guy right up before him. And he looked at Seymour and I while he was ministering. And matter of fact, he came right up into Seymour's face. And he said, brother, that changed me. Do you know what he was saying? I went to a new level of grace. He was saying, I went to a new level of grace. We need to keep going up in grace. Keep going up into doing what we cannot do. If there's something in your life that you cannot do, that's where grace, if we'll pray for the Lord, give me grace. Grace will kick into that thing that you cannot do. And, that, and the grace can get greater and greater. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you're walking and doing things and you look back. That's why Moses was the meekest man. On, that said that me, Moses was the meekest man that ever lived was because he understood he couldn't even talk. He couldn't do anything. He could do nothing. But he watched God move, and in his humility and his brokenness, he watched grace uh, uh, kick in. And if we understand grace, do you know if you understand grace, pride can never come in? It can never come in. Because you, if that's where the scripture says, look in the mirror and see who you're looking at and don't forget what you have seen because you know your own flesh. And when God does the extraordinary through you, then you could say, wow, that was grace. That was grace that did that. So when you lay hands on people and God begin to do extraordinary things, you could say, grace did that. Grace did that. So we've got to understand grace on a level like we've never understood it. And grace has got to be so rooted and grounded in us that no matter what God does through us or how weak we are, even our weakness, we say we can't go forward. But if we'll pray for grace, grace will get us to do what we cannot do. What we physically can't do, what we can't do. Grace is, is that power of God. The only thing I began to say after God showed me grace was, Lord, it's amazing grace. Grace is amazing. What it can do, it fills all of the gaps and all the broken pieces, all the I can'ts. It fills it all up to overflowing, and it brings you up to God level. Not like God, but it brings you up to working with God and being with God 
And when God says, go, yes. grace will carry you and you yes. can go where you could not go. That's grace. So this week, as you just, you just, you know, in your time with the Lord, please just begin to pray, Father, I pray for grace to be granted. And that don't stay at this level of grace, go to the next level of grace. And with that grace, it's going to take faith to walk in that grace. And then go to the next level of grace. To the next level of grace. Until we're filled. Like I love what Seymour wrote in Stephen. Stephen was filled with grace and power. So his face shone like an angel. That means he was filled with God, not with himself. And that's what God wants. He wants saints that are not filled with ourselves. But filled with the grace yes. of God. That's Amen. grace. Amen. It's the grace to do what you Amen. cannot do. Right. But you got to pray for it. Yes. You got to seek it. You got to cry after it. And when it comes and when it shows up, step back and say, hey, that wasn't me. That was grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This is twofold. I want to try to paint you something that you can see so that you will understand what your pastor is after. I've been painting it for you. Some may have caught a glimpse. Others, a deeper understanding. For some, you might not have understood what I have been saying yet. So this is another moment where I want you to try to catch it. When the first trumpet sounds in Israel, one trumpet, it's actually the opposite of what we mostly think. That is actually the place where the leaders come on the first trumpet blast. When the two trumpets, you blow one of them, the leaders come. All the moves of God thus far have been saying from the throne of God the Father with Lord Jesus the Christ seated as his right hand beside him. The one trumpet has been saying, I want you to be my leader, will you arise in my house as such? Will you give your life for me? Lay down your will on me. Come and experience my power and turn and give it away freely without cost. And many a person has taken the first trumpet blast and like Brother Tozier's friend, rose in the house, but then put a price tag to it. Their own self-worth somewhere. And the Lord says, I'm still looking. I've got some, but I'm still looking. Now what we think is that all of Israel assembled on the first trumpet blast. What God did was speak to all, will you be my leader? And some heard. That first trumpet blast is usually through the laying on of hands and the manifestation of heaven. That's what I've been trying to teach you for a while. There is a second trumpet that is sounding when the twin trumpet sounded, all of Israel gathered. But when all of Israel gathered, it was time for the leaders who had already gathered to speak to everyone the plan of God. At which time, those who fear go to their tents. Those who lap wrongly don't become part of the army. 
You understand this? It's the opposite of what we think. The call goes out to all, but all don't make the call. But the call is to all. In the middle of it, all hell will come for you in your individual walk with God. Gossip, slander, criticism, fault finding, lying spirits, deceiving spirits, they'll all come for you. You have to not be taken off your game. And your game is to stay humble before Lord Holy Spirit. And how did the enemy get to us? In our pride, in our lust, in our flesh somewhere. So now we're to desert. That was the first half. Now this is desert. I can tell you how to actually love. The Lord thy God, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Are you hearing a first trumpet when I speak, or are you hearing a second trumpet? I can't tell, except for the fruit that shows up on your life. See, a lot of people, even though the first trumpet is a sound to leadership, a lot of people are just as content as they can be to have someone come on and lay hands. Just as content as the day is long, as the end of our hunger for manifest presence. Just bless me, O oh God. Now, I'm not speaking out against being blessed of the Lord. I want every one of you to be vessels that can lay hands on and give away blessing. Amen? May all of us become carriers of the glory, carriers of the power, but it belongs to God, but the ability to surrender and be used, all of us. But I'm after something greater. I'm after what Brother David saw. See, Brother David didn't lay his hands on that guy that got straightened up, born crippled and crawling on the ground. And while Brother David was over here laying hands on God did. God did. Nobody laid hands on that guy. He just got his body straightened out, my Lord, Holy Spirit. Every bone, every sinew, every muscle, every part of his body came whole in creation power. While David just watched God. And then Brother David did this. My Lord, I've been on this grace and this faith and this moment of glory for a while. But what I just saw you do, I'm going to hunger for that now. And if that was grace that brought me up, glory, power, you come on up here. You understand this? That's what Brother David said. When he came to me in that meeting, and he said it as a gift from God to me. That's what he did. He said, Seymour, I went up one Come on, brother. Go up with me. I'm going up. Machine, la cate, la sti, caraste de stista, kudashi, bakute. I'm trying to tell you that there's a place where we don't want to lay hands on as the greatest expression out of Messiah's church. No. We want God the Father to consume atmospheres over cities. We want God the Father to drop his conviction power over nations. We want to go train tens of thousands of leaders in a nation because great Lord grace dropped on that nation. And every leader in the nation is coming to our meeting to listen to the instructions of how to walk with God and be completely, totally, holy His. At the same time, while that remnant army is rising, there's going to be a great falling away and there's nothing you can do about it except pray that those you love don't become one of them. Because it's in Scripture and it's going to get fulfilled. 
Every jot till my oda is going to come to pass and there's nothing we can do to stop scripture. So our job is to be the remnant that loves the Lord. And the remnant is not small. The remnant is not small. Nor can they do small things. <laughs> they can do anything God does. Because they know it's not them and they just let God do it and they hang with God. I'm going to talk to you about right now how to hang with the Lord. Okay? Now, I'm going to be done before you know it, and you're going to be waiting for more instructions, and it's going to be gone and done. You're going to have to hunger now and listen with a spiritual ear. He who has an ear, hear right now. The first thing you have to know is whether or not you are in your spirit or in your soul or in your flesh or in your strength. You have to identify which one you're in. Let that sit for a moment. If you're in your soul and you think you're in your spirit, there's a lot of training still going to happen inside. You got to know when you're in your heart. You got to know when you're in your soul. You got to know when you are in your mind. You got to know when you are in your strength. Now, most of us can figure out when we're in our strength. Let's suppose that you're in your heart. That's your motives. If you can figure out by Lord and Holy Spirit administering grace what your motive is, you can figure out that motive. My motive is to be loved. Wrong motive. My motive is to love. Right motive. You take that motive and you give it to Jesus on the altar. Lord, I just discerned that I wanted to be heard instead of listening. I give my desire to be the one who speaks to you now. You just loved the Lord with your all in your heart at that moment. Let's suppose you're in your soul. Plenty of times I am studying before the Lord and I am hearing, Lord, Holy Spirit, give me the wisdom of heaven. And Jerina will say something to me and my soul will try to overtake my spirit who's hearing God and say, don't you wish she would ask before she speaks and just interrupts you like that and takes your thought away? Now you're going to lose that revelation, aren't you? Because now you're going to confuse your mind and not write down, you know, that's my soul. That's not my spirit. That's my strong willedness. So now i got to say, oh, I am in my spirit, man. Where does grace come to? Spirit, man. So in my spirit, I gotta say, so you are being strong willed, and I'm gonna take you right now. I'm gonna give you to the will of the Father. I take my will right now in Jesus' name, and I give it to you, Father, for your will to be done in my will. Now you just love the Lord thy God with all your soul. Y'all can figure out mind, right? I'm never thinking right now. We're using that mind. Your thoughts are just flowing with Lord Holy Spirit. Putting two plus two together in all kinds of scenarios. But is it the mind of Christ? When it begins to think outside of who Jesus is, as our mind not the mind of Christ. When it's thinking who Jesus is in that scenario, that's the mind of Christ. And so now, I wouldn't want to venture out to say how much of my mind is not the mind of Christ. How about you? But when I can, when I can catch it, no, I will not have that thought. I will have the mind of Christ. What does scripture say? And then I step into 
the mind of Christ in my thought by the word of the Lord, by scripture. Now I have made my mind love the Lord my God with all of my mind. You understand this? Deep is calling out the deep right now. At the sound of thy water spouts. All the water spout is is a tornado at sea that's sucking that water. But it's reaching for everything it can get deeper and deeper and deeper. And what's way down inside there, God is wanting to declare on how. So the deep things of God are reaching for the deep things in us. That's what's happening right now. Don't get lost in that. This is simple. What about your strength? Well, I'm ready for Seymour to shut up and go get that hearty burger. Let me paint that picture of that hearty burger one more time. That thing is, uh, what is it? What's that beef? Anybody know that beef? Angus, Angus beef grilled, the dark charcoal grill wines are on the meat, mayonnaise is on the bread, a slice of fresh tomatoes on top of that, lettuce laid over that, sprinkled with a little salt and pepper, capped off with a great, awesome level of cheese. Amen. And your strength is saying, mm-hmm. Now for me, that doesn't work as good as two pieces of Church's fried chicken with four jalapenos. Two breasts and four jalapenos. Amen. And two rolls. Greg says that'll work for us. We are brothers. Amen. And a corn on the cob, pecan pie, and a order of french fries and an around the world. In case y'all don't know what that is. That's when you just take the drinks and go across. Dun, 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 till it's filled. That's around the world. I learned that in Philly 35 years ago. That was when I was in the hood. I can tell you things about the hood now. I can tell you one thing, you gotta live in the hood to understand the hood. I lived in the hood eight years, I know the hood. I was protected while I was in the hood. The guys on my block adopted me and had my back. Boy, you don't know what that's like. Oh my. That is a love you cannot know until you know it. You can't know that till you know it. For a guy multiplied by 50 who doesn't have a father to adopt you. The Mormons would come by, the Jehovah's Witnesses come by, and they would say in their unsavedness, we don't want to hear you. If we want to know anything about the Bible, we go ask Seymour. <laughs> Amen. Today, we have eight preachers off that block. Mashiach, the Kati, Nele, Ki, the Kuti, the Holy Spirit says 12. Mole, Kalista, Shalaski, Kalaski, Stasta. They were all professional thieves with a blade up to a widow's throat in the middle of the night, starting at age 12, learning how to tape up the glass and break it with a hammer. Greg knows all of that. Amen. Y'all don't know that world. Me and Greg know that world. Come to our house, beat up by the boyfriend, bloody. Come when they need it. Worm medicine for their puppies. Never had a puppy, didn't have a clue. Come when they need a dog, you know, patches for the inner tube. And then they would, so I'd have to go out and take each one and teach them how to get the inner tube off because you just give a screwdriver to a kid that's never taken off a tire before, off of a rim. In patching one hole, he's going to 15 more by the time he gets it off. <laughs> so, joyous times. Now we're at the last. When you can catch your strength, being your strength, and you say, Lord, this won't do. This won't operate up under grace. No. 
I am weak, I gotta know it, so therefore I choose to find where I am weak, and Lord Holy Spirit is my teacher, you just identified my weakness, it's my strength. When I think I'm strong, that's when I'm weak. So I humble myself to the true weakness that I am, and I look to you, Lord Holy Spirit, to be the strength, not by might, not by power, but by you, Lord. Holy Spirit, then you just loved God with all your strength. Now, if you take those four and you just figure out where you are and keep giving it to God, you will love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the proof of it now? You know, God has got a testing for every sword. What's the proof of it? and love thy neighbor as yourself. Amen? So when's the last time you baked a cake and took it to your neighbor? When's the last time you cooked a cake for you? So then, <laughs> so then, do this. If y'all take sweets, did we get sweets, buddy? We got almost gone. A lot of bread. If y'all take bread, take bread to your neighbor. Take 10 loaves to your neighbor. Tell them, listen, our church gets this free and it's going to go bad. Would you please bless me by taking this? Don't go in a spirit of superiority. That ruins the whole thing. Because nobody cares whether or not we get a two or three or four or five dollar loaf of bread. But if you say, would you please help me? I need to give this away before it goes bad. They'll take it and be grateful, and a friendship will emerge. So then, would you stand with me? Right where you are. I need you to hunger for the Lord to be the Lord over atmospheres. Would you bow everything inside of you to Him?
You are Lord over the city. You are Lord over every heart. You are Lord God. Ministry. Look to you, Lord. Only you can do, Father. The city is yours, Father. And ours to claim. You've given it into our hands. And in Jesus' name we bring every soul included by Lord. Holy Spirit, search by your grace, Lord Jesus. And we cast it down. Give us a crown, Father. Cast down on your glasses. See. Give us the crown of this city, Father. Cast down on the glassy sea and present to the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ the Righteous.
as waters call to waters. Oh my God, I
want you to go. Those you love and say, in this lesson, we come to church to have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit encounter with Almighty God. There's no other reason to come. You're dismissed. Amen.